If you enjoy Jerusalem Unplugged, you may also like to listen to Stories from Palestine podcast. My name is Crystal. I am originally from the Netherlands. I am married to a Palestinian and I live in Beit Safafa between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. I studied history and tour guiding and I produce a weekly podcast called Stories from Palestine. You can find it on your favorite podcast player or go to the website storiesfrompalestine.info. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm Roberto Mazza, your host, and today it's with great pleasure that my guest is uh, Omer Enav. Omer just finished his PhD at the University of Tel Aviv, and is currently teaching at the University of Haifa and also at the Adassa Academic College in Jerusalem. But more importantly, he recently published a book in Hebrew, which I roughly translate as Defend the Goal uh, sort of a football and Arab-Jewish uh, relations in British Mandatory Palestine, which basically tells us that, uh, once again, after the uh, wonderful interview with Nicholas Blinko, we're going to talk about football in Palestine, but this time focusing specifically, uh, you know, in the period of the British mandate. But first of all, Omar, welcome. Hi, Hi Roberto. Glad to be here. Omar, my first question is very much about yourself. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and perhaps also how you came to work on football in Palestine during the British mandate? Okay, so um, I came from Middle Eastern studies. I uh, did my, my bachelor degree at uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, and then I uh, continued to, to Tel Aviv University uh, to master degree, but in some point I just, skipped it and uh, went directly to the PhD. And I, I had an idea, I'm, I'm a sports fan since I remember myself. Um, and, and I thought maybe, you know, out of academic uh, uh, writing, maybe I'll write a book about my favorite team, which is, I can now reveal in the start of, of the, the talk, is a Paul Tel Aviv, uh, not so good team these days, but uh, you know, you, you you cannot choose your, your team, she, the team chooses you. Um, and I wanted to, to write a book about it, not, non-academic book. And um, along the way, I got really good advice that, uh, from a professor who told me, why don't you write a PhD dissertation about football, try to, to combine something that, that works. Uh, and then, you know, I started to develop the idea and I said, okay, I love football. I also have a lot of interest in the, Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the mandate period, and why not combine both hobbies and uh, to write something about it? Still, it, it, it was not written until I did it. I mean, the, the focus on this period of time and this Jewish, Jewish, Arab, and British relations. I think it was great advice to combine a PhD with a love for sport and football. So I wish there would be more because they have. Fascinating works. Uh, let me ask you something about uh, football in general. So if we go back to uh, sort of the beginning of the British uh, uh, rule of Palestine, how did football come to Palestine? Uh, do we have examples of uh, football predating the, uh, the arrival of the British or is that essentially a British enterprise? Uh, although the British would like me to say that it's a British thing, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I have to say the truth. Um, like many other things in, in the Palestine culture, uh, football uh, come, came here uh, in the Ottoman, late Ottoman period, uh, late 1890s. I found the first place that football was kicked to the St. George School uh, in Jerusalem, uh, which, you know, has its English influence. Uh, so that was the first place. 
late 1890s, also Raudat el Ma'aref school uh, this year. Uh, if you look at the Jewish uh, uh, football, so we go a few years later uh, to the second Aliyah, uh, uh, Russian Jewish immigrants that came to Jaffa and played football there. So this is the first time the football came to uh, later Palestine. Uh, a few years later, it, it, football uh, uh, played in Turkey and Egypt, uh, uh, in Istanbul and Cairo and Alexandria. Uh, but in uh, football started to develop this, those years, First World War just make the whole thing collapse uh, because no one had time uh, to play this game. It was too hard, you know, it was not institutionalized. It was just a hobby. Um, so, you know, it, it, it naturally uh, no one, it, I found some evidence to uh, Jewish Arab uh, games during the First World War, but it was, not so many. There's a well-known story about a young Turk, uh, Mustafa Kamal, who came to Tel Aviv as a young officer and learned to play football from uh, players of, from Jewish players in uh, in Tel Aviv. So uh, yeah, I must say uh, that I was ignorant of this story, uh, but it's a fascinating one. I wonder if it's uh, some some sort of uh, in some historical narrative about uh, him, or it's just like uh, disappeared. Uh, in the last hundred years or so? Uh, I think maybe it, it's a, if someone wants to make this research, so you know uh, about uh, uh, Turkish president and the uh, football skills, it, 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 it lasts till today. So maybe it, it can be a, a, a nice topic to research. Another PhD in sports. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm curious about something. So you, you said that uh, uh, football was obviously introduced uh, in the late Ottoman era. And obviously, World War One stopped everything. Back then, was football for children, for grown-ups? I mean, what, what kind of sport we are talking about? Something uh, like what, that people were uh, sort of attracted to, or was literally something for uh, for kids? Also, it depends on which community you ask about. If you ask about uh, uh, the Arab Palestinian community, it was just an elite thing. Just you know, in the, in the colleges and the schools, it was very uh, bourgeois uh, uh, thing to do with, within the, the Arab Palestinian community. In the Jewish yeshuv, it was more uh, a popular game, but on both sides, it was yes, it was uh, uh, I think more of a children's game on that time. There were also adults, but mostly children used to play this game and they, they learn it in, in school. Uh, and, and yes, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good point that you made it. And, and those years, um, actually, until now, I didn't think about it, but I think you can identify the game those years with uh, children and, and up to high school age. Yeah. Interesting. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more how the arrival of the British affected the, the game of football. I mean, uh, you use already the word institutionalization. So this idea that eventually football became something official. And I was just wondering, you know, what happened after 1918? So the British have arrived and how football, how did football develop since their arrival? Yeah, so it's even the, my periodization of the research is 1917 to 1948, which in other words, is the British era of Palestine, the men that started Officially in 1922, but 1917, the first soldiers of Allenby crossed the border and, and started to, to uh, climb north until December 1917 in Jerusalem, the famous entrance of Allenby to, to Jaffa Gate. And, and I actually I found uh, evidence, you know, in, in memoirs of British soldiers in 1917, they tell how in the desert, you know, near El Arish and Gaza, they, they came from Sinai up north and they in when they didn't fight and they had some time to rest no it, no it's a, it's a war and it, although it's ugly thing you have some time to rest and they play football they play football in the sand in the desert we know the stories about football in first world war in europe it's a famous story you know uh, uh, about the christmas uh, game and everything but also it, it happened in the middle east and the british from the first moment uh, uh, make it very clear that Football is, is a crucial part. Uh, first, you know, because they are the, the, the empire, the rules here. 
and also it's well it's the place that football born uh, so you know it's, it's all other thing to try to try to implement other sports here uh, cricket uh, rugby not so great success I uh, have to say but football became the most popular game among Jews and Arab uh, imme- almost immediately and uh, uh, Ronald Stoll which I show you familiar with the hero of Jerusalem in the in the, in the uh, British era the first governor the military governor and then a civilian governor of Jerusalem and he he, he he tells in his memoir that in the first days in Jerusalem he, he traveled between the villages around Jerusalem and just gave ball football to, 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 to the youth because he said maybe if they will play they will not go political even even he said even British children if, if you don't give them outlet to their energy they become political and and we have to not let this happen in Palestine that, that's what he said Ronald Stoll who's a very interesting character indeed and uh, I'm pretty sure he didn't like football I mean given that he was from this uh, sort of a, a you know elite uh, status uh, uh, from Britain but he understood certainly that the power of uh, playing essentially uh, but also he was probably wrong about the politicization of uh, of football which he probably couldn't uh, uh, foresee uh, but obviously that happened and I want to talk uh, about that later uh, I was just curious about uh, you know if you have any sense of the earlier, players and games how did the british you know sort of uh, organize the first uh, football games in palestine and whether they were like teams with mixed players whether jewish arabs british or from the very beginning we have some sort of a sectarian and sectarianization of football okay that, that i had a complex answer to, to, to this good question uh the british start to uh, first of all after the war so if you know uh, uh, We started some recovery of the football uh, institutions and, and Maccabi, I didn't mention Maccabi, which is the great uh, uh, and the main Jewish uh, uh, sport organization or federation in Europe back in the 1890s. Uh, and, and also here in Palestine was the first and only uh, sports uh, uh, federation those years and after the war, uh, uh, the branches in, in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are, 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 are were built again and and it this is this is a very important thing to understand the British they established the Jerusalem Sports Club for the the, the government officials you know uh, uh, high commission the high commission of the first one Herbert Samuel uh, came to Jerusalem on July 1920 and uh, with him there was a lot of, of uh, 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 government ministries and and, and uh, official, British officials and they spent time in Jerusalem and you had to find something to do uh, uh, while not in office. So Jerusalem Sports Club was established in, in, in March 1921. It's, it, actually, it's a nice story because the inauguration of, of, the, of the club and the game, it was between the German colony and the British colony uh, in Jerusalem. It was a big event and uh, there were some very special guests, uh, uh, Samuel himself and uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, who came here uh, to uh, on this date March 1921 but they both didn't show up for the game because they were busy in 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 established other uh, uh, mandate mandate entity uh, east of the Jordan River and uh, they were in talk with uh, Abdallah at the same time so they didn't come to the game uh, so they left stores alone he had to make a speech and, and to and to, to uh, start this game and And in this game was a great example because it was a civilian team against military team so the military of course it was 11 British soldiers but the civilian team you would expect it would be com- combined for uh, Jews are British whatever there were nine British in the civilian team one Arab priest and one Jewish player that's it and that's a symbol of Of what the British were trying to do and what they did in reality it's, it's a fascinating story but and I was just wondering I mean in terms of like uh, do we have a sense of the quality of the game I mean was this like uh, considered decent football or people were just complaining and say that you know it was just like some sort of entertainment game and you know just one hour and a half 
you know, watching a bunch of uh, young men in shorts kicking a ball? Well, from the beginning, there were many complaints for uh, the, the, the British referees, because until the 1930, there were only British referees, not Jewish, not Arab. And it's great because you have some, someone to blame. And it, you, you always want to, to, to blame your boss in everything. So if the British referee was, was his fault. Uh, and I mentioned the, the Maccabi clubs. Uh, in the middle of 1920s, the, uh, they had the uh, new friends, Hapoel, Hapoel Club, which is the uh, Workers Association. Hapoel is, is the worker in Hebrew. Uh, the third Aliyah uh, brought to Israel a lot, a lot of socialist uh, workers that, that need also they search for outlets for their energies and, and from, you know, the, the hard work in the roads and, and in the villages in Israel Valley, uh, et cetera. So they established the Apoel uh, uh, organization, uh, first in, within the Maccabi uh, uh, organization, but then they started, you know, the ideology split, ideological uh, uh, split, and the Apoel uh, became the rivals of Maccabi. The same time, I, I mentioned the Palestinian uh, uh, concentrated within the, the elite. This time, the middle of the 1920s, it started to go out from the elite, the first a, a, a big club is the uh, Jaffa or Young Orthodox Club uh, uh, 1924. Uh, a few years later, the Islamic Club of Jaffa. We started to see clubs in Gaza, in Jerusalem, uh, Hebron, Nablus, uh, all these places uh, we see Palestinian club. And also, uh, all the time it was, you know, uh, uh, two steps after the Jewish, uh, the, the Zionist sport institutions. Uh, and that was the, the state of affairs all along the, the mandate period. This connects perfectly with, with uh, what I wanted to ask you about the development of Jewish and Palestinian uh, football. Uh, were teams essentially connected to political organizations? Uh, did they follow, I don't know, particularly looking at the Palestinian community, sort of religious affiliation, so either Greek Orthodox, Catholics, uh, Muslims, uh, and what, are, what about the Jews? I mean, are they all Ashkenazi Jews, or there is also sort of intermixing with, uh, let's call them just Mizrahi Oriental Jews? Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was not the same on, on, on the, the two uh, communities. The Palestinian community was identified with, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the religious and ethnic uh, uh, um, affiliation. Uh, Islamic, Christian, Orthodox, Maronite, uh, uh, um, you name it, all the, the mixture of, of identities here uh, in Palestine. The first uh, uh, club that, was, that said, I'm an Arab club, I'm a nationalist Arab club for all Arab, Christian, Muslim, was the Nadir uh, Riyadi uh, Al-Quds, uh, Jerusalem Sports Club, 1927. Their uniform were the, what, you know, if you look on the last month, we see the flags of Palestine in, in, in Israel that were controversial in the Israeli discourse. So the uniforms of the Arab sports club in Jerusalem were this flag, you know, the nationalist Arab flag, which became PLO flag and the Palestinian uh, uh, flag. So it was it, it's really beautiful. It, I have a picture from the Palestinian newspaper Really beautiful uh, uniform, you know, for who the, uh, I, I personally love to see uh, the, the, the history of the, what the players were, were in the, in the, uh, on the field, and it's, it's great. Uh, um, so yeah, that, that's the Palestinian side. The Jewish side was uh, much more political. Apoel, you know, is it, it, the team of, of, of Mapai, of, of the ruling party of David Ben-Gurion and Barry Katzenelson, uh, and uh, Later, Beitar is the theme of uh, Jabotinsky and the revisionist uh, movement. So, yeah, it was much more politicized. But also in the Jewish community, you have you had the themes of of the uh, ethnical groups. You know, uh, uh, Yemen uh, and uh, Sephardi Jews from from uh, Jerusalem, and they they had their themes. But it was really uh, not strong and not very uh, significant uh, in country level. I'm curious about languages. I mean, nowadays, if we look at uh, football in Israel, uh, 
I mean, even Arab teams, they obviously have to use Hebrew as some sort of a lingua franca for, for the league. I, I was wondering, is there a sense of uh, which language or which languages they used uh, amongst the players, in, you know, between teams, the officials, obviously you mentioned they're British, so English must have been very popular. Uh, were there language barriers between uh, the teams and players? Actually, I have a good story about that, but I have to jump ahead to, to, my, to uh, the, 19, the Second World War, 1940, 1941. Um, so that time, uh, uh, you know, the Arab society, the Palestinian society, pretty much collapsed after the Arab revolt, 1936, 1939. Uh, so the Palestinian club, uh, they joined the uh, Palestine Football Association, which was, was Zionist. And the club joined, and you know, one of them of their demands was that all the documents of the association will be translated to Arab to Arabic. And of course, surprisingly, out of the blue, uh, the Zionists refused. <laughs> they said, We don't have enough people to do it, we don't have money, we don't do blah blah blah. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it hurt. It hurt because the, the, it was like the Palestinian club felt once again that they're not part of this organization. No one cares about them. Uh, and, and yeah, it, it was kind of, uh, how do I put it? Uh, uh, it's too bad because it was a chance to make something nice. It would not change the future. It would not uh, prevent, I guess, 1948, but uh, uh, I wish it would happen, and it didn't. I guess we will go back later to uh, sort of the end of the Monday, but this was definitely a good story. Uh, and also the complexity of football and how football also reflects uh, uh, sort of daily life of, of individuals living in Palestine at the time, and the various communities, particularly arriving into Palestine, bringing with them languages, different cultures, and so forth. I'm curious about the politicization of football. Was it uh, immediately made it uh, political by the various parties? Or is there a moment in the history of uh, football in Palestine that actually football was just a game? All, the, all along uh, in the mandate period, and maybe after, but I focused on the uh, period I researched it. It was all the time also, you know, not politicized and, and also very political at the same time. For example, I, I have a lot of, of stories, so yeah, a story for every, for every topic. Uh, in 1930, uh, you have the, the, the white, white paper uh, of Passfield. Uh, you know, it was a, a great uh, a controversy uh, between uh, the Jewish community, the Yishuv, and the British because there were limitations about uh, the immigration and, 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 and selling uh, uh, land to, to Jewish people. So in, in a, the British, there was a fight in, in, a, Brit, in a game between British police, uh, uh, between the British police and, and, and Hapoel Haifa, Haifa, and the High Commissioner decide, decided, it was a Chancellor then, he decided to ban all civilian teams in Palestine. The British, British will not play against any police, any, uh, they say civilian, they, they meant Jewish team. So there was one Saturday, there was supposed to be a game in Haifa between Apoel Haifa and, and the other uh, uh, British team. And the British team didn't arrive because of the ban. So the Jewish team didn't know what to do. They were in the game, you know, they, 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 they put the uniform, they, they waited to start play. So what, what, what is the solution? The closest team was the Arab club of Haifa. Of Haifa. So they invited them and they came quickly. And there was a game between uh, Apoel Haifa and the club uh, Itihad uh, from Haifa. And at the same time, the Palestinian leadership also banned the, 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 the Zionist leadership. So, uh, you know, you see from one hand, you see the, the, the ban and all the influence, how the, the politics uh, enters the field. Uh, and you, it, you cannot say no, you, it, it just, one, it's one thing, but the other end here you see Jews and Arabs play together, uh, although despite this uh, uh, conflict, and this is just one example for uh, uh, how it worked work 
most of the time. Of, of course, there were times, you know, of conflict and violence that Jews and I did not meet on the game. It was, uh, it was not realistic and, and, and it was just uh, too hard to, to accomplish. I want to skip ahead a little bit because you just mentioned something very important. I mean, in your book, you talk about also the relationship between football and violence. And I was wondering to what extent football mirrored the events uh, that unfolded in Palestine. So in 1920, you know, the Nibi Musa riots, and then 21 Jaffa, 29, obviously, uh, the Wailing Wall riots, and then the Arab Revolt, 36 to 39. Uh, did football follow the same sort of pattern? I mean, was it influenced? Or people maybe kept football as an arena for entertainment, despite uh, the, the eruption of violence? Uh, I'm sorry, but again, my answer is both. Uh, I actually wrote an article, and it's in the book about uh, 1929 uh, uh, riots uh, in, in Palestine. Uh, no, not many know, but, but the, the violence in Jerusalem began on a football field. Uh, yeah, in, in August 17, 1929, uh, Jewish uh, children played uh, uh, in the field, and the ball was kicked to to uh, uh, to a uh, uh, garden of, of some Arab uh, falah uh, in Lista. Began a fight. A, a Jewish boy stabbed and killed uh, a few days later. It started on the football pitch, and you know, on the same football pitch. All the year before that, 1929, there were so many games between Jewish team and Arab team and British team. And, and just until August, it was actually 1929, it was the best team, best year, sorry, uh, 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 of Jewish Arab cooperation in football. Although, you know, there was a, a lot of tension uh, around the Western Wall uh, uh, all this year, and then it interrupted in, 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 uh, 19, uh, in, in August. But despite this, there were great relations between Jews and Arabs uh, during this time. But you know, if you look on the uh, uh, Arab revolt, so you, you look at a lot of, of players, Jewish and Arab, uh, you look at them, you know, they're, they're fit, they're in good shape, uh, they know how to, to run. Uh, so yeah, they were part of the military uh, effort uh, on both sides. And you can find the story that they found explosive in the uh, uh, Islamic club in Jaffa, they, they looked they searched inside the club and they found inside the football uh, shoe explosive. It was just one story, but you, you cannot separate violence and football during this time. No, today, football players are not join the army. The, the, in Israel, they get, you know, they, they, they just, uh, they don't do it uh, all around the world, uh, of course. But back then, because they didn't, they were not professional, they didn't get, paid for, for football, so they had to, to make a living for, uh, for military activity. But that's fascinating. And I must admit, I didn't know that uh, Israeli professional football player would actually skip the army. So uh, it's a new piece of knowledge. Um, no, they're, they're not necessarily skip, but you know, they're, not, they're definitely not uh, holding a gun and go to fight in the borders let's say, a different kind of service, an alternative yeah. one. I'm curious about, uh, you know, this idea of uh, institutionalizing football. And so I was wondering, when did uh, the Jewish and the Palestinian uh, sort of communities began to actually form organizations and what kind of organizations they formed? Uh, and also, you already mentioned that obviously there were contacts between the communities. And I was wondering if these organizations, uh, you know, try to cooperate or maybe even organize games together or from the get-go, they just uh, operated separately. Okay, so, so uh, uh, the Zionist sports uh, uh, institutions were ahead of the Palestinian ones. And there was... Uh, a, in 1920s, the goal, as you no, know, as other aspects of Yeshuv and what the Yeshuv tried to to tried to be a state in, at some point. So, uh, in, from an institutional perspective, so they were trying to to, to uh, establish a 
Jewish Zionist uh, Association, Football Association. And they did in 1927. The big challenge was you know, to make peace between Apoel and Maccabi. That was the big rivalry. It was more house than, than the Jewish Arab or the, or the Jewish British. It was really big uh, controversy. And, and it, they, they made it. But it was a problem because if you want to be a part of FIFA, the International uh, uh, Federation of Football till today, so you have to prove to FIFA that you represent all people of Palestine uh, with you no know, Jewish, Palestinian, whoever lives here. So what, what they did, uh, the, the founder of, of the association was uh, Yosef Yekutieli. He was a big, uh, big dreamer. He, he wanted to big, bring the Olympic to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, it didn't happen, but uh, he did form the, the uh, Maccabiah, the first Maccabiah, the second Maccabiah. It was really, he did great things. And on the way to do that, one of, one of the stops was the establishment of the, uh, Jew, of the uh, Palestine Football Association. And he knew he had to convince uh, Arab representatives to be a part of the association. So what he did, he knew Arabic very well. He, he served in the Ottoman army uh, in First World War as a, a, a sports teacher in Nablus. He knew Arabic. He worked with Arab because uh, uh, it was a daily job uh, in the uh, electricity company. Um, and he approached his friend, uh, some uh, notable uh, uh, Arab from Jerusalem, and he made him convince the secretary of the Arab Sports Club in Jerusalem, Ibrahim Salim Nuseiba, the, the famous Nuseiba uh, uh, family. He came to the, the first meeting of the, of the association in 1928 in Jerusalem. He came to the meeting, he sat there, he didn't say a word. It was the first and the last time he came but he signed on the paper and the association six months later was a part of FIFA. By the way, the, the, the recommendation to the acceptance was from Egypt. Egypt was the, the, the groom of the, of the, of the Palestine uh, Football Association. And that's a, that's a nice story. Of course, you can guess what happened. The Palestinians didn't feel part of this association. And also we're talking about the late 1920s, the start of ni- 1930s. Uh, you know, the, the nationalistic uh, uh, feelings uh, uh, in, in Palestine were, were uh, uh, rise, uh, and the Palestinian uh, Sports Federation uh, established in 1932 uh, as a competition to the other uh, uh, association. Uh, and yes, of course, they didn't play one against each other. It was not some Arab club stayed in the Palestinian, in the Palestine uh, a sport association, the Zionist one. It took time to, to move to the other one. But the Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestine Sport uh, uh, Federation uh, collapsed in the revolt, as I mentioned uh, earlier. 1938, it just stopped being. Uh, and the, the Arab club stayed with, without uh, institution. And they didn't have choice. The, they the, uh, uh, joined again uh, the Palestine Sport uh, Football Association. You also already mentioned Josef Yukutieli, who is a very, very uh, interesting character. I mean, this, this guy shows up in, in many ways when we talk about uh, sports. Um, and he's also connected to the sort of the international dimension of football, which you discuss in your book. And so I was wondering if you can actually place Palestinian and Jewish football within the larger international context. You mentioned games with Egypt, but did these teams uh, play with uh, you know teams of other uh, countries? How did they interact with each other? Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, the, the you know the 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 Jewish sportsmen, uh, also you know the the secretaries and the coaches and the players, most of them came from Europe, from uh, Central Europe, Central Europe, East Europe. And they also, they goal, their goal all the time was to play against European teams because they want to feel part of the most advanced football they, they can. And European football was better than the Middle Eastern one until today. Um, so the, 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 the goal all the time was to connect with uh, the, uh, the European teams, but it was really hard because to travel to Palestine, uh, you know, uh, to sail, uh, it take weeks 
it's expensive and, and it, it, it not happened so, it, so often. It, 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 it's a story, so that it, it's a big thing to do, but it's really simple to play against a team that's from the neighborhood, Egypt, which is the most developed sport country in the region because the, the, the early British influence there. Uh, um, so Egypt was the goal, but also Egypt not all the time wanted to, to, to contact the Zionist institutions because you know they were better. So they, they also aimed to uh, uh, Europe. So it's not Egypt, they, they were very good relations with Egypt and, and there were the, uh, uh, maybe if we have time, we talk about the World Cup uh, uh, qualification stage in 1934, uh, Palestine against Egypt, two games, a uh, 7-1 in Cairo, 4-1 in Tel Aviv, both for Egypt, no need to say. Um, but uh, uh, I want to, so, to talk also about Lebanon and Syria. It was really, if you think about, uh, let's think about a club from Haifa. It's easier for, for the players to, go, to you know, get on the, the train and travel to Beirut or, or even Damascus than to go to Jerusalem. Uh, it, it, and the, the borders are open. We're talking about uh, mandatory times, uh, French, British mandate in uh, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, France, Jordan. Uh, so yes, that, 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 uh, it was, uh, uh, there were very good relations. Uh, Lebanese teams came to, to Palestine, Palestine uh, uh, Zionist teams traveled to, to Beirut, Damascus. But the problem was that, that when you have two associations here, so the Egyptians and the Lebanese are in problem because they want to play against the Zionists because they have very good connection and they, they, they have no reason not to, to, to connect with them. But, you know, the, the, the Palestinian uh, uh, nationalists uh, told them that it's not okay. They're hurting, the, they're, they're uh, undermining the, the Arab national uh, struggle and how they can play against the Zionists. It, it, it's unbelievable. That they do it, so it, they, they were in problem, and the, the the world cases where uh, Lebanese or Egyptian teams came to a visit, they played Jewish teams in Jerusalem and and, and Tel Aviv and Haifa, and the Mufti uh, got mad, and a, a day after they just organized from nothing a game against Palestinian teams that, that everyone everybody would be satisfied, uh, and it was not so convenient uh, situation so in 1935, it stopped. The, the relations between the Jewish team uh, and the Arab teams from the region stopped because they had to choose. They didn't have to choose. They have to choose someone and naturally they chose the Palestinian side. Uh, the relations got better again during World War II because uh, the Jewish, Jewish Arab relations in Palestine were better. Uh, okay, it, was a, it was a great part of the development of the football here. Uh, the, the relations with the international arena. I have a million dollar question. Uh, given the current status of uh, Arab-Israeli uh, relations, particularly some of the Arab countries that are, for whatever reasons, getting closer to Israel, do you ever expect a game played between, I don't know, Israel and Egypt or Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, the Emirates? The short answer is no. <laughs> now, if you, if you remember the last decade, uh, Muhammad Salah, uh, it was not, it, not the big star of Liverpool today, he was the player of, of uh, football club FC Basel. He played in Tel Aviv against uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv in the qualification of the Champions League, and he had a problem. He didn't want to come. He didn't want to come to Israel, but they forced him to do it. So he came, and there's a movie, there's, it's a great scene. You know, the start of the game, Players shake hands from both teams. He didn't shake hands. He did a fist like this, and, and he didn't. And he gave it to all the players of Maccabi. It was his protest. Of course, the big protest is that he scored goals that uh, may help his team to win and to eliminate Maccabi Tel Aviv, uh, which I'm not sorry for. But uh, it was uh, 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 one example. Maybe with the goal state, it will be different because. You know, the people in the UAE or uh, Bahrain or whatever, they don't have the same hate 
uh, that Egyptians have towards Israel in terms of you know the education and the history. Israel, Israel and Egypt, you know, go way back in rivalry and everything. Uh, so I have to be pessimistic uh, about it, unfortunately. I just want to ask you something about, uh, um, you know, going back to the question of, uh, of, of violence. So obviously the relationship between football and violence is a complicated one because it's about uh, crowds, it's about players themselves, and sometimes it's about the politics behind the various football teams. And I was wondering if you have uh, perhaps examples of the uh, various forms of violence that developed uh, uh, under the British in Palestine between uh, uh, teams, but also between, you know, clubs uh, as, you know, Palestinians and Jewish uh, clubs. Yes, you have you know, some very uh, daily stories, you know, violence between fans, uh, uh, between the crowd, that they're throwing stones and, 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 and bottles and everything, which is, yeah, it happened. To be honest, it happened more with, uh, uh, between Jews and, and British, British and Arab, uh, much more than between Jewish and Arab teams, I must say. The violence was kept out of, this, of, of, of the field uh, most of the time. But I have some interesting story. I, I go back again to 1929. Uh, Apoel Tel Aviv, uh, the socialist, the workers team, uh, uh, well known. Uh, they had a player named Simcha Chinkis. He was uh, also uh, a policeman. He also a member of the Haganah organization. Uh, he played for, for a police team with, with the Arab players. He played in Apoel Tel Aviv. In 1929, he's he, he a policeman standing in, in, uh, uh, in the road between Jaffa and Tel Aviv. And he see his friend uh, uh, killed in the Arab attack on Tel Aviv the same day. He just took his gun, uh, ran inside Jaffa and killed a Palestinian family. And he was sentenced to death. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, he got released after six years, you know, in the, uh, uh, it was the 70th birthday of, of George V. Uh, I think they, they just uh, there's a lot of, a lot of prisoners. He didn't die. He became kind of a hero. But in the Zionist narrative, he got he, he was forgotten because I think it it was not something to be proud of. He he assassinated a family with no reason. Although you know it, it was inside in the context of violence, uh, tough violence uh, in Tel Aviv and Jaffa, in all Palestine. But it's it just one example of, of, of the, the connection. I, I wrote about it a lot in the book, specific on this play. The, he had a cooperation with Arab in the police, uh, with his team in Apoel. I, I tried to examine what he felt, what, what, what was the main uh, uh, factor, what made him uh, to do what he did. And, uh, and I tried to, 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 to figure it out because it, it, today we, can, we not see we don't see this case. We don't see a football player that, that holding a gun. As we talked about it earlier. Back then, it was part of, of the life. Uh, it was a national struggle, struggle between two communities, uh, and it's hard to, to separate between the, the, the political struggle and football. Uh, another example is a, a British officer, a British policeman, uh, Raymond Caprata, which was also a, a fantastic football player, fantastic. One of the best, he played with, also with Hinkis in Apoel, Tel Aviv, and in the best British team. And he was the commander of the police in Hebron. Hebron was the most horrifying massacre in, in 1929. It was just a terrible place to be. And he was the commander there, and he was blamed by the Jewish community that he didn't do enough. The British, uh, the British praised him for, he, he did prevent uh, one case, he killed the uh, Arab. Uh, uh, that attacked and tried to rape a, a, a Jewish uh, girl, but you know all, all the sides blamed him. Uh, typically, you know, uh, the British felt felt that both Jewish and Arab were blame, blame, blaming them in the situation, and he was a great case study for that. He, he I think he, he he made a record because in two times in the difference of 17 years, Jewish and Arab tried to kill them. 
separately. <laughs> so that's something to be pr proud of. Uh, and, and they asked them if, which of the community preferred is pro Arab or pro Jewish. He said, leave me alone, I'm pro British. Which makes sense. Yeah. I, I have a couple of more questions. And one is very much picking up on an article. Uh, and I think there are two versions, one in Hebrew and one in English. Uh, that was published, in, uh, published on Aretz, discussing basically your book and mentioning the question of Beitar Jerusalem. And essentially, if I summarize it correctly, the argument was that uh, uh, at some point, uh, Arab teams were kind of eager to admit Beitar Jerusalem into their own league, which I found it fascinating. And I was wondering, first of all, you can tell us a little bit more about this club which is uh, for a variety of reasons, probably not very good reasons, but certainly very famous, uh, not just in Israel, but outside Israel too. And, and also, you know, a little bit about uh, the, the story. I mean, the relationship between Beitar and Arab clubs. Yeah, okay. So I need to say that uh, also in my book, you can see, of course, in, in Alex, the, the, the headline was about Beitar Jerusalem. I understand that. I, I, it's, it's, Okay, that, that, that journalism. But I have to say the main story of Beitar during the mandate period is Beitar Tel Aviv. Today, this team is, is not significant, but Beitar Tel Aviv, it was the most famous uh, uh, team uh, of Beitar. Beitar is the, uh, uh, the movement of the revisionist Jabotinsky. Uh, today, it's the, uh, you know, it's the Likud party. It's uh, today's version of, of, uh, of this movement. And Beitar Tel Aviv became the best team in Palestine in 1940. It was just combined uh, consequence, consequences and, and it just became the best team. But they had a problem because Bakabi and Apoel, which had continuous fight between them, they didn't want Beitar to be part of, of this fight. They wanted to leave them out of this. So Beitar was left out. And at the same time, if you remember the Arab club, joined the association again in 1939-1940 in World War II. So you have Beitar and you have the Arab-Palestinian club. Both are neglected by Apoel and Maccabi from the association. So they find themselves in kind of alliance, kind of. Not, it, it's not alliance because Beitar had difficulties to cooperate with Arab. Although, you know, the, the ideology of Jabotinsky, uh, if we know it, 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 it the, the relations uh, to Arab is very respectful and, and not as, you know, as can, what can people uh, maybe uh, think today. Uh, Jabotinsky thought that the Arabs should be uh, equal and have rights and be a part of, 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 the, of the Jewish state. But so Beitar uh, uh, did cooperate with Arab uh, teams and uh, Beitar Jordan specifically they were not so good team in the 1930s. They, just, they began to be uh, important in the in mid, let's say, 1944, 1945. And then they, I found that the last game between the official game between Jewish team and Arab team in Palestine before 1948 is between Beitar Jerusalem and the Dejani club in uh, Jerusalem in 1945. And on that time, Beitar Jerusalem got an offer from, from the Palestinian, Palestine Sports Federation to join them. I cannot say how much serious it was, and it was not so close to happen because Beitar, although they did want to have to be part of the Zionist Association, they always, it was not a question, they always preferred the national interest, and it was not a question at all. But I, I do mention that in 1946, the Palestine Sports Federation tried to uh, uh, be accepted to FIFA uh, uh, because they want also recognition. It didn't succeed, of course, uh, no surprise. FIFA said Palestine need one association and work it out between you two, don't bother us. Uh, but Beitar representative in the in Zionist Association they were angry and they say to Apoel and Maccabi, it's because of you. You left them out, the Palestinians. If you will give, let them be in and given the place that they deserve, 
they will not go to FIFA and ask to be recognized as other uh, as association here in Palestine. It's your fault. You don't know and you don't understand that you have to, to, to let them be included, They're not excluded. So it, it, I think if, if you look at it from today's perspective, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's not surprising to people who uh, uh, know and, and research the mandate period. It's not so surprising. But in today, today's perspective, it is. Yes, I guess in today's perspective, when you look at Beitar, you know, it, it's completely different. Um, and actually, I just want to add here that I, I recently started a new research into Beitar because I found out that uh, uh, actually members of a Beitar uh, football team trained in Italy at the Porto of Civitavecchia, so close to Rome, sponsored by the regime of Benito Mussolini. And some of these members eventually, they're also trained, uh, trained with the Italian Navy uh, and eventually became uh, officers of the, so to the newly created uh, Israeli Navy in 1948. So again, politics, military, ideology. Uh, and again, it's, you know, there is this sort of a paradoxical, I would say, connection between the Beitar movement and fascist Italy, right by the time when uh, Mussolini adopted the racial laws, which excluded Jews from uh, uh, sort of Italian society. Uh, again, eventually these laws were disattended and it's only with the Nazi occupation of Italy that these laws were you know, picked up and Jews suffered the consequences. But it really shows also this uh, sort of a paradox uh, and the link between Beitar and fascist organizations. But, we leave yes, it I, just, uh, I mentioned, I think uh, uh, Dan Tamir wrote about uh, the connection between uh, the revisionists and, and, and the fascists. Uh, he had some research and, and I also mentioned a recently published book of Shaul Adar in English. It was published in the UK about uh, Beitar Jerusalem. More contemporary, recent years, and, and, but he tells us, he starts from the mandate period uh, and he shed light on, on, on the club and its political aspects and uh, its uh, also very uh, recommended. Yeah, and it shows that uh, in every country, I mean, uh, I would say almost inevitably, football teams have political connections, uh, uh, whether, I, you know, whether it's a Labour Party, socialist or right wing, and uh, there are expressions of uh, social classes or religious organization. I mean, uh, if we look at Turkey, which is another country where uh, football teams are essentially politicized to the point that, you know, they can be distinguished between pro or against, uh, you know, the current regime and so forth was in Spain between Real Madrid and Barcelona. One essentially was the team of Franco and the other was the opponent. So it, it's a fascinating uh, sort of uh, history to read through the lenses of football. I have one last question very much about the legacy. What is the legacy of uh, sort of the British and, you know, and football in general uh, after the, the end of a British mandate? So I would say, if we look just, you know, through the sports lens, so the, the British succeed in, in implementing this game. It's the most popular game in Israel, although we're not so good at it. Jews and Arabs alike, no, we're not good. We're not getting the hint. We're not under, we just refuse to let it go. But there is no competition. It's the most popular game here. And I think it is the legacy of the British. Uh, it's, a, it's a question if you know, if they were not here, what would happen and what was the place of football? But they were, and it, football, it, it, it's a British thing. Uh, you cannot deny it. Back then, it, it, the place where the football born. Uh, so I think in, in terms of football, uh, the legacy is, is quite clear. But uh, you know, there, there's a lot of history after 1948, what happened to Palestinian clubs in, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Israel, in Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, uh, Al-Wahdat uh, club, for example, the Palestinian club in, in the refugee camp in Amman, uh, which came to a, a, a big team, the rivalry of uh, Faisal, the, the club of the Hashemites. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things to say and, and actually, uh, uh, there's a lot of research, research about it. Tamir uh, Sorek wrote about it, and Amir Ben Poat, and other researchers. Um, and it's it quite is interesting, but if we jump to, to uh, today's, 
just last week, the, the big uh, thing in the Israel national team, uh, Monas Dabur, uh, the Arab Muslim player, he, you know, he, uploaded, he wrote something controversial last year in, in the uh, um, Jewish Arab, uh, Palestinian Arab, uh, Israeli uh, conflict in May uh, uh, 21. And it was a big scandal, and you know the the fans in the stadium of the Israeli national team booed him, and they they didn't want him to play. Now he need to decide what he's going to do because there's a lot of pressure from his family to uh, resign and, and not play for the national team again. Uh, but I would say that if in the mandate period, British had to force, in many of cases, uh, Jewish armed cooperation in football. So today, there's no necessity, necessity for that because uh, there are many Arab players in the Israeli national team. No one forced anyone to do it. They just had, had equal chance because, and because they are good, they are playing there. And it's, a, it's almost, you cannot find this equal uh, uh, thing in, in other uh, fields in, in, in Israel. Maybe just in hospital, or pharmacies, but if you look at academics, on politics, on the, the war, high tech, whatever, you cannot see what you see on the football field and the Israeli national team and the Israel Premier League and everything. So I, I choose to say because uh, there are some, maybe it's an optimistic take on, on the situation and then the thing that got a little better than 80 years ago. This was uh, Omer Inav author of, and this is a rough translation, Defend the Goal, Football and Arab-Jewish Relations in Mandatory Palestine. The book has been published in Hebrew. Omer is uh, currently teaching at the University of Haifa and the Adassa Academic College in Jerusalem. Omer, thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, Please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.